our next speaker is uh, Kai Lai Shu from uh, Stanford, and he's going to talk about uh, data driven inverse modeling with incomplete uh, observations. All right. So thank you for giving this uh, this presentation. So we need to don't forget to unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, sure. I can hear you. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I will talk about data uh, driven inverse modeling uh, with incomplete infor uh, information or observation. And uh, there are actually several talks on inverse modeling already. Uh, so I will quickly give a review of inverse modeling. And inverse modeling uh, is used to identify a set of parameters or functions uh, in your models uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, that has some output. Uh, that ma uh, matches your observation or measurements. And uh, generally, you have the forward problem where you go from the model parameters and then you three to the physical laws, you only describe by partial differential equations, and then you obtain a prediction of observations. And this is usually called the predictive modeling. And the, for the inverse problem, you start from the observations, and but you do not know the model parameters. So you, you combine your observation and the physical laws to get the estimation of the parameters. Uh, well, uh, you, mathematically, you can formulate the inverse modeling as a PD constrained optimization problem. Uh, here, LH is a loss function, uh, which can, for example, which can be a, 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 a square loss between your prediction and the observation. And FH is uh, the PD constraint, and the theta is the model parameter to be calibrated, and the UH is the uh, solution. And you can view FH as uh, a discretized version of your numerical uh, of your uh, PDE, such as numerical solver, uh, for example, finite element method or uh, finite volume method or finite difference method. And uh, a, a very special case for the inverse problem is that your model parameter is not just a, a, a value or a vector, it's a function. Uh, and, this, uh, and there are a bunch of examples for this kind of uh, PD constraint optimization problem. For example, the Koopman operator in dynamical system or constitutive relations in starting mechanics. And the problem here is that the candidate solution space, that is the space F lies in, uh, is infinite dimensional. And, uh, and then the idea uh, is yeah, it's very similar to what Chris just uh, talked uh, in, a, uh, in a second talk, uh, is that you want to preserve the physics, but for the unknown portion of your model, you can substitute your, your, your unknown function using a neural network. So in this way, uh, you, you reduce your uh, function, uh, function inverse problem to the pa pa uh, parameter inverse problem, that is, the parameter, the model parameter here is the weights and the biases of the neural network. And the advantage of this, uh, of this method is that it satisfies the physics to the largest extent because you are using a uh, numerical server to enforce your physical constraints. And, and the, for the, the, the reason for using a neural network, uh, yeah, uh, as, is, uh, yeah, as claimed in many uh, research works, is that the neural networks generally exhibit uh, capa uh, capability of approximating high dimensional and complicated functions. And also uh, the, the, the neural network outputs is uh, differentiable with respect to the weights and uh, as well as its inputs. So that gives us a way to, to uh, compute the gradients of the neural network. And then, uh, because we formulate the, the inverse modeling problem as a PD constrained optimization problem, then we can apply any uh, optimization tactic to this, this problem. And, and in this talk, I will focus on a gradient based optimization method to, to, to this PD constrained optimization. And, um, and for, for gradient based optimization approach, the key is to calculate the gradient descent direction, GK here, and then you want to update your parameter. Uh, in this direction. And uh, this is uh, a diagram for your inverse problem optimization. Uh, and uh, you, you, you have a PDE, you have a model parameter, 
uh, given the model parameter, you, you, you have PDE and then you estimate some uh, predicted data based on the initial and the boundary conditions. And then you also have some observed data. So you, you want to measure the discrepancy between your di predicted and observed data. You formulate the loss function. And then you compute the, uh, calculate the gradients of your loss function. You get this GK and you use op optimizer to update this parameter. And uh, by the way, in, in my work, I usually use the, uh, the, the, the BFGS optimizers. Uh, because you only we have a very small data, small bunch of data in the physics, so we can afford this kind of uh, quasi second uh, order optimizer. So um, yeah, yeah, Chris, uh, this morning Chris also talked about the automatic differentiation. So uh, I will not uh, give details on that. Uh, but uh, then the mathematical fact that enables us to use uh, automatic differentiation to to do this kind of inverse modeling is that mathematically, uh, the so-called back propagation in neural networks uh, is equ mathematically equivalent to the reverse mode automatic differentiation, which is uh, also equivalent to the so-called dis discrete or joint state method, which is the standard method uh, for, uh, for, for doing this PDE constraint optimization uh, in, in the classical work. And yeah, and if you just uh, write down your uh, numerical, uh, your, your, your deep learning neural network uh, uh, computational graph and also the, and the computational graph for, uh, your, uh, for, for the PDEs, you will see very similar structure here. And you can view that, that each, for, for example, for, the, for a time stepping uh, numerical scheme, each, layer, uh, each time stepping can be viewed as just uh, one layer in the neural network. And then this is also the intuition behind uh, why we can uh, well why we can apply the automatic differentiation to numerical solvers and do the uh, do similar stuff. And the key to leverage automatic differentiation for inverse modeling is that we have to express the numerical schemes in the AD language. Uh, the AD language is the computational graph. Uh, for example, here I show a, a, a computational graph for two-phase flow problem. And each, uh, each node in the graph is the operator, and each edge in the graph is the, uh, is the data. Uh, for example, uh, u is, uh, is the velocity, and the theta, uh, and the phi may be some porosity, and, and the next psi may be some potential. And for each node, it can be a numerical operator. Uh, and the, the, the basic unit of numerical operator is just like uh, plus, minus, or, uh, uh, or divide, or multiplication. And, but in, uh, on a higher level, each operator can also be a numerical scheme. For example, the scheme I showed here, it is complicated a numerical scheme, which, which is nonlinear and implicit, but in the computational graph, we can treat this numerical scheme as just the one node in the computational graph. So that means no matter how complicated a numerical scheme is, we can express that uh, as, a, uh, as a collection of operators in a computation graph, and then they are interlinked via those state variables. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, do you have any questions for now? Okay, so. Um, that's fine, yeah, thank you, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, so, so for, so, um, I have, yeah, I have introduced the automatic differentiation, but, uh, but most of AD frameworks only deal with explicit operators. By explicit operators, I mean the functions that has analytical derivatives, uh, for example, a sine and cosine, or plus or minus, uh, or a composition of these functions. And then this is actually uh, what the people are using in deep neural networks. They, they usually have, ex uh, they, they always have explicit operators and the, uh, the, the activation functions or the linear transformation, they are all explicit operators. However, uh, for many scientific computing algorithms, many algorithms are iterative. For example, you have GM Rice or Newton Raphson or implicit. For example, uh, you, you, you have to solve a linear system or you have to, do, uh, yeah, you have to uh, solve, a, uh, solve a linear equation, solve a nonlinear equation using uh, you using neutral Raphson or using bisection method. And I summarize all the operators into four forms uh, based on whether they are linear or nonlinear, explicit or implicit. Uh, and for the first two cases, the AD framework applies directly. Uh, yeah, if it is linear or if it is uh, nonlinear but explicit. 
But for the, for the last two cases, uh, the implicit operators, the AD framework, the, the most AD frameworks cannot deal, uh, deal with them uh, ex uh, directly because uh, for those operators, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the derivatives are not ob obvious. So how do we deal with that? Uh, I'll give you an example to illustrate uh, the idea behind uh, physics constrained learning. And let's, let's think about a function which maps x to y. Um, however, this function is not defined explicitly. It is implicitly defined. And the implicit uh, definition is given by this formula. You want to solve y from uh, x. And if you are not using a cubic formula for this, uh, for this expression, you only need to do some, for example, the Newton's method here or bisection method here. So the question is how to do AD for this operator. And one, one obvious way is to just like record all the iterat iterative steps and just do back propagation through each iterative step. But that can be very expensive, especially in the context of uh, PDEs. You have to save all the intermediate steps, the traces of that, and also you have to uh, go backward. And, and if you are solving a very stiff problem, there may be hundreds or yeah, yeah, hundreds of iterations, and that can be very expensive. So uh, a more efficient way is to imply, uh, apply the implicit function theorem. For example, for this function, we can, uh, well, yeah, if you, uh, uh, yeah, you can recall from the calculus that you can treat y as a function of x and then take the derivatives on both sides. And then you get this equation and then you solve for y prime and then you get this equation. And the above uh, grid, uh, gradient here is exact. So the problem is, can we apply the same idea to inverse modeling? The answer is yes. And actually, if you apply the same tactic to this physics constrained optimization problem, and then you, you, you can get, uh, yeah, you, you, you can finally arrive at this equation. Uh, I will not give uh, details of the derivation here, but, then this, but then the idea is the same as uh, deriving the gradients uh, here, y prime. So the, the key here for efficiency is that is how to evaluate this term. There are two ways. First, you, you evaluate the uh, right, uh, the, the two terms on the right hand side. You evaluate these two terms first, and then you, you evaluate the whole term. The second strategy is you evaluate the, 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 the terms on the left hand side and the two, you two terms first, and then you evaluate the whole term. And actually, uh, Actually, uh, analysis shows that uh, you should compute on the left-hand side first. You, you first uh, solve, uh, compute this term, which is equivalent to solve a linear system, and then you calculate the gradients uh, for, for, uh, for, for the whole term. And for this, for this step, actually, you can leverage the automatic differentiation again to compute the gradients with respect to theta. And for the first step, the challenge here is to compute the partial f or partial u, and f is a high dimensional, and the, uh, the, the dimensions of f is a high dimensional, uh, and the dimension of u is also high dimensional. Uh, u is the discrete uh, solution to the uh, PD system. And this is usually available in the forward computation. So if that is the case, you can just save it and reuse it in, in this step. And in, if you use this strategy, you will only have to solve one linear system. But if you use the other strategy, you will have to solve uh, the uh, p, uh, p linear system, where p is the number of parameters in theta. And you can think if you, are have, you, you, you have a neural network, and the theta is the weights and the biases of the neural network, and then this can be quite expensive if you use the, sec, uh, you, you use the first strategy. So this is the key here. You, 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 you need to compute the gradients in this step. So this is a summary of the methodology. And this is the same uh, diagram as I showed here. And the only thing I added here is that you can also use physics constrained learning if you have an implicit scheme. And also for the uh, model parameters, you can either have just the physical parameters or you have the curl functions, the coefficients of curl functions like piecewise linear or radial basis functions. You, you, you can have uh, neural networks. You can even have random variables, uh, which I did not uh, show in this work, but, uh, but you can actually use like generative neural network. Uh, you, you plug a generative neural network here and, and do, some, uh, do, do some adversarial or uh, training or optimal transport-based training. Uh, yeah, but, but we will not discuss it here today. 
So before I go into applications, do you have any questions with regard to the methodology? Okay. No, I think that, 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 that's great. Yeah, just, just uh, watch the, the clock. Yeah, if we could finish around 12, 30. Yeah, 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 10 minutes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I will talk about the two applications. The first application uh, is elastic full waveform inversion for subsurface flow problems. And then this is actually a coupling of two equations. The first equation is the wave equation, which goes from this rack, uh, rack, rack spark modulus to, to the seismic data. And this, is governed, this process is governed by a wave equation. And then the second equ equation system is the fluid dynamics equation, which is the evolution of the CO2 uh, saturation uh, in the subsurface. And, 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 and then these two, these two physical systems are coupled by uh, the rack buck modulus. Uh, actually, the, phys the physics is that uh, the, the CO2 sequestration process will change the uh, subsurface properties like the racks and it will affect the buck modulus, and the buck modulus will in turn affect the wave propagation in the subsurface, and the wave propagation will, uh, will affect your observation data. And the, the, the problem of the CO2 sequestration problem or time lapse uh, of FWI problem uh, is usually like you, you, you have the seismic data, but you want to infer the underlying uh, fluid dynamics properties, like uh, like what, what these equations are, you want to estimate the evolution of the CO two uh, saturation, and this is actually a, a pretty standard uh, uh, inverse problem. Uh, you you have some unknown here, and you have some observation here. But the difficulty is that you you couple two equations together, and for the fluid equation, you can you, it can be very complicated. It it can be a nonlinear equation and and here I showed you a, a, a two-phase flow uh, equation here, and we, we, we have several tasks here. Uh, and and actually, for, for to solve this equation, I use the uh, I, I use the uh, final volume method. And the, the most challenging step is to solve this equation uh, for for solving for solving a fluid dynamics equation. And this, this discretized scheme is highly nonlinear. So that means you have a highly nonlinear implicit scheme and you have to apply Newton Raphson here. And even, uh, and, 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 and also you, you, you might want, you, you want to accelerate this equation. You might use many fancier uh, solvers like uh, algebraic multigrade. So, uh, so, so the, the difficult, Difficulty for this kind of problem is how to backpropagate uh, through this numerical server, very complicated numerical server, and the uh, and and we use the physics constraint learning to do that. So let's see some results. For the first result, uh, I want to estimate this k parameter, which is a space varying uh, permeability parameter, and I assume everything else is known. And this is the uh, this is the true estimation. Uh, this is this is the true permeability parameter. And we ran this inverse modeling uh, problem, and we got this uh, got this estimation. And you can see it matches the true parameter very, very well. And in, in the second task, uh, we assume that the relative permeability is unknown. This relative permeability is a function of I1, uh, which is the saturation of uh, of the CO2. Uh, and, and it also goes into this nonlinear equation and it goes into the Newton Raphson uh, operator. And uh, yeah, you do not have to know the details about that, but, uh, but the, the, the k here is that it is an unknown function. So we substitute the, the unknown function using a neural network. And actually you have kr1 and kr2, so I use two neural networks to approximate that. And then the training data is, is the observations at, a, at just the four locations. So that, that's why I call it the incomplete observation. The, and, and although we only have four observations, actually four observations of a time series, we can, act, we can see that actually these four observations hold all the information to refer, uh, to, to, infer the, the, uh, to infer these two permeability functions. And you can see that the estimated uh, uh, permeability function and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the true permeability function matches very well. 
And then in the third example, yeah, uh, yesterday Mata also talks about uh, the, 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 SD, uh, the, the inverse uh, problem of uh, time, uh, time fraction or space fraction of PDEs. And then in this example, I substitute this uh, dynamic system using a, a you uh, using a time or uh, space fractional uh, uh, PDEs, and I want to I, I assume that the fractional operator, uh, the, the fractional index like like here, the time index or the space index is unknown, and I want to estimate those parameters, and I do the same. Uh, I, I apply the same strategy as before, and then you can see that for for for. For the, for, for the data with no noise, I can estimate those parameters quite accurately. And yeah, and if this is equal to one, that means this, and this, this is A star is the true parameter. And if it is equal to one, that means this is exactly uh, true, uh, uh, correct estimation. And, for, and for, for the noise, we also have a good estimation. That's, uh, yeah, so, so, that I, so that I claim that this strategy is actually very robust to noise. And the second example, let's just say, oh, five minutes. The second example is the inverse modeling of a basic car elasticity. And in this, this, in this equation, I also consider a multi-physics problem uh, where I have a coupled system of the geomechanics and the fluid dynamics. And they are coupled together. And I also, to, to make the problem more challenging, I consider the basic car modeling well the the string uh, the, the constitutive relation is expressed here uh, sigma depends not only on the current string sigma is the stress the stress not only depends on the current string and also depends on the string rate and I you uh, to to simulate the, the data and this is the setting of the uh, domain and uh, I observe I assume that I can observe the horizontal displacement on these sensors and to describe as the equation, I use finite element uh, for the geometric mechanics and the finite volume for the fluid dynamics. And, 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 and to simulate the observation data, I use uh, the so-called Maxwell model uh, for viscosity. So I get some observations. What I want to do is to estimate this, estimate this, uh, uh, this, this constituted relation. To do that, I use a neural network to approximate that. And, uh, and especially, I have to use uh, a term like this, H, Aveston, N plus one. And H is a free parameter. H is a symmetric, a positive, definite matrix, but it is unknown. We need to calibrate this matrix. And also, the, this neural network is unknown. So the free optimization variable are the weights and the biases of the neural network, as well as the a symmetric a positive a definite matrix of this. I use this form because it, it is consistent with the uh, thermodynamics now. Because of its symmetric a positive a definiteness, uh, the string energy is convex. And also, and also this, this term at, at n plus one and, and the term at n plus, at, at Everstone n uh, indicates that, that this term is, uh, is rate dependent. Okay, let's see the result. And uh, to, to make a comparison, I compare with the space varying linear elasticity approximation. I approximate, and then this is the candidate, uh, another uh, alternative model. Well, I approximate the strain stress relationship using linear elasticity. But, uh, but here, the linear elasticity matrix is assumed to be space varying. That means for each location, uh, it has a different linear elasticity state law. And this is actually a very popular model for, uh, for doing constitutive uh, relation modeling. And this is the result. And this is the uh, one misses the stress at the, at the terminal time. And I show you the true stress. And, and this is the stress uh, predicted using a neural network. And this is the stress predicted using space varying linear elasticity. And, and as you can see that the neural network performs well, uh, very well in this case, uh, using this metric. And I also showed you the, display, uh, the displacement and the stress tensor for this location, for, for the left top uh, point. And, and this is the space varying linear elasticity. We can see that it matches the data very well. However, if we, we test it, we, we use it to test on a uh, on, on, on the data, we have not a scene. For example, the vertical 
uh, stress and the vertical displacement, it, we can see that it, it does not uh, fit it very well. And also the stress tensor, which is not uh, in the training data, it is uh, also deviate, uh, deviating a lot from the true data. And this I, I attribute it to the uh, overfitting of the linear elasticity model, because as you can see, I have a different H matrix for, for different locations. So you have a lot of free parameters. But for the neural network, you can see that it matches very well and it does not overfit. Uh, yeah, although the, the, the stress is deviates uh, from the true value, but it's very little. Yeah, so uh, I would like to close my uh, uh, talk using some, with some perspectives and like scopes and the challenges and the future work. Uh, and the, first of all, the, the physics-based machine learning is an innovative approach to inverse modeling. And actually, uh, we, we just replaced the unknown portion of the system using a neural network to, so that we can satisfy the physics to a largest extent. Also, we do not throw away all the uh, efficient numerical servers like finite element, finite volume. We, we, t we leverage those servers to make a very efficient uh, numerical simulation and uh, numerical computation. Secondly, for the automatic differentiation, the, auto on the automatic differentiation is not new. It has existed there for decades. Uh, however, uh, nowadays, uh, due to the development, uh, due to the ad advent of deep learning, many new softwares, AD softwares, like that in Julia, has been developed. Uh, and those softwares are very robust, scalable, and flexible. Uh, and, it, and it will benefit us a lot if we were if we uh, import those, uh, those, those software or those techniques to scientific computing to, uh, to facilitate like inverse modeling. Uh, last but not least, uh, it is not a panacea. Uh, many uh, scientific computing algorithms in the inverse modeling cannot be translated to the AD language. For example, uh, the problem I pointed out today, like the implicit operators, uh, they are not already, uh, they are not readily uh, uh, applicable in the current AD frameworks. So we have to supplement it using uh, more techniques. And finally, I would like to uh, uh, introduce the AD CME software, which is also written in Julia, but uh, with TensorFlow backend uh, for numerical, uh, for, for the inverse modeling uh, uh, using, uh, using automatic differentiation. And it, it actually combines the, the uh, 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 the advantage of Junior uh, as well as TensorFlow because TensorFlow has some uh, really nice uh, uh, parallelism uh, mechanism and also very robust and uh, yeah, it has a lot of uh, good uh, points there. And also for Junior, it, has, uh, it is very good at implementing numerical schemes that do very fast uh, scientific computing. So this is like a combination of the best of the two worlds. And yeah, and, and, and there are a lot of work surrounding this uh, ADCME framework, uh, like the two I introduced uh, today, like FWI flow, and also the POF flow, which, uh, which is uh, currently under development. And these two, FWI flow and the AD seismic, uh, AD seismic is a general approach to a seismic inversion, uh, is already available online. So if you're interested, you can take a look at it. And yeah, uh, and I think that's the end of my talk. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, great. Thank you, yeah. Very nice. Um, so any, any questions from the, the audience? Yeah, I, I have one question. So why do we use uh, TensorFlow as the backend? As oh, oh yeah. Talk, so Julia actually has all the, all the functions, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, just, uh, just uh, just uh, as I talked uh, here, uh, right now uh, I use TensorFlow because uh, because the because TensorFlow right now has the uh, parallelism and also is very uh, is a very good at micro uh, at uh, it has many GPU kernels already there and so I can migrate uh, my algorithm already to to to, to TensorFlow. Uh, however, I think that the backend is not a very important issue here. Well, uh, of course, I can just uh, change any backend to PyTorch or to Junior itself. Uh, I think it's the algorithm that, that, that is the most important than the, the philosophy behind that, that is the most important to the 
uh, to the current uh, framework. Yeah, as, as the technologies uh, developed in the future, maybe we will find some uh, a lot of very uh, a lot of good technology that we should rely on to develop this kind of inverse modeling. Thank you. Any other we plan questions? Plan on this in the general, so that way, um, so that way, the standard differentiation rules across the rest of the ecosystem will work with this TensorFlow backend, or uh, pardon? Uh, can, can you start so, again your question? We didn't hear the beginning. Yeah, do you, do you plan to hook this in a chain rule so that way you can use their VJP and G, uh, JVP operations with the TensorFlow backend, or you know? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, TensorFlow does not have many utilities for this kind of scientific computing uh, stuff. For example, uh, it has very weak support for sparse linear algebra, so I have to write my own kernels. Yeah, for those kernels, it's just like uh, yeah, it's just like you write your kernels in C plus plus and 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 using TensorFlow to to uh, you making it as, as a shared library for TensorFlow to call. Yeah, well, I'm I'm kind of wondering that because I mean a lot of these kernels have been defined, for example, in the base Julia, and then chainrules.jl adds a rule for the sparse, you know, multiplication and stuff. Like yeah, that. yeah. It, would would you plan on making use of the chain rules setup? So the yeah, yeah. I I'll point. take a look at the the, the junior native uh, uh the native automatic differentiation. That that's actually very interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. Since for this for this work, uh, the the major focus of mine is not uh yeah which which language do you, uh or which language or which framework do you use? Yeah, and yeah, the major thing is that uh I want to uh I want to leverage automatic differentiation for this kind of inverse modeling. Yeah, but 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 of course, if we can do it natively in junior, that would be great. Yeah, we should get you in the, in the Slack channels and we'll discuss more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so maybe we wrap it up here. So yeah, thank you very much, um, Kailai, for this, uh, this wonderful